Mankind, there they are. They're in the condition we looked at last week out of Romans chapter 3. Man is in trouble. Look, look at your Bibles. Maybe some of you weren't here, so we'll, we'll bring it back up to speed. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Halfway through, partway through. As it is, well, right there at the beginning. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. And what that means is man is in trouble. What we saw back... Back in Romans chapter 1, the listen to this. The wrath of God, chapter 1, verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed. It doesn't say it will be. It says it is. Let me tell you something. That does not bode well for men who are not righteous, not even one, who don't do good, not even one, who have all turned aside, who have together become worthless, who don't seek God, who don't understand. This doesn't bode well when it says the wrath of God is revealed. It doesn't say it will be, it says it is. That's not good. When the God of heaven and earth wants to send a message to fallen men, Here's a letter. I mean, just about everybody agrees there is not a fuller, more glorious presentation of the Gospel in all the Bible than what we find in the book of Romans. As far as just complete, as far as deep, as far as spanning the depths of what this salvation looks like, it is one of the fullest, most comprehensive books it's, it's wonderful. And here's the Lord. He comes and He has a word for man that's fallen like this. The wrath of God is revealed. And how did we see that it's revealed? Why is it revealed? It's revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them his invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Guess what? Every one of us here is without excuse. You know why? When you look at leaves turn colors, fall off the trees, come back again next spring, and go over and over, when you see the seasons change, when you see... When you see grass grow and it makes seeds and the seeds fall off and they get blown in the wind. Have you ever seen seeds with little parachutes? God's saying, when you look at that little seed with that little parachute and you see the wind take it away, you're supposed to say, not what a bunch of people say. I mean, can you imagine somebody's watching a man parachute out of a, an airplane and they see the parachute there and they think, Oh, the Big Bang caused that. An explosion caused that parachute. What God intends for us to do is look at that little seed with that little parachute and say, wow, there must have been a designer. His fingerprints are all over His creation. So much so that man is without excuse. And what man does, you know what, you know what it says? Man suppresses the truth. He doesn't... It says, verse 21, Although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. They became futile in their thinking. Their foolish hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise. They became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. You know what man has done that is his great crime? You say, what? Murder? Rape? Nope. You know what his great crime is? He exchanges God for everything else. God in all of His eternal attributes, all of His divine essence and nature, and all of His glory. And man looks at that and he falls short. He chooses sin. He comes short of the glory of God every time. He exchanges that glory for that of the creation. And because of this, the wrath of God is revealed. And like we looked at, what does the wrath do? 
Verse 26, for this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. God's wrath already revealed. How's it revealed? It's revealed, I mean we look around, it's revealed in calamity. It's revealed in hurricanes. It's revealed in tsunamis. It's revealed in earthquakes. It's revealed in death. When God says to the sinner, that's it. No more. And He cuts them off. But even more so, or even more direct to the passage, when you see God giving people up to dishonorable passions, women changing natural relations for those that are contrary, men likewise giving up natural relations, that's God's wrath. It's already revealed. Listen, people think God's happy with them, God's pleased with them, or they think, well, you know, it's, it's when I die that I really have to worry about all this. But that's just simply not what Scripture says. In John chapter 3, many of you know the verses very well. Listen to what it says. As at the end of John 3, verse 36, it says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. It abides on him. Even now the wrath of God abides on him. Okay, well here's, here's, here's all these people, there's none good, and God says, I'm going to send them a word. I'm going to send them a word about salvation. Well, what does this salvation look like? I and mean, what's, really, what's the book of Romans dealing with? Salvation what happens is we find that there... Remember what happened? God, God sends His law down into the mix of these people. And what happens? There's none good. Not one. He sends His law and He doesn't mean to show men by that law that there's a way to Him by keeping it. He means to show men that they're sinful and to shut their mouths. That's exactly what it says in Romans chapter 3. The law of God is meant to shut mouths. 3.19, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. What the law says to us, you're guilty. Don't boast. Zip your mouth. Don't think you can come to God and offer anything. Listen, that's where we're at. And I know we've got people in here that for all your sin, you think you're pretty good. I, I can tell you this. You know what the law says to you? If you've got any thought has enter, ever entered your head, that you're going to get to Judgment Day and somehow it's going to go well with you because you've been good enough, abandon that hope right now. That's what it's saying. If, if you even say that, it's saying, shut your mouth. And it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. You guys, have, you guys have seen the Way of the Master stuff? Some of you guys watch that? I mean, I love the one where they go in to the penitentiary, state penitentiary somewhere up in the Northeast. They go in, they have armed robbers, rapist murderers that they bring in and they interview. And they ask them, are you good and are you going to heaven? And every single one of them says, yes, basically I'm good at it. I know, I know I've done a lot of crimes. I know I'm bad in the, you know, a lot of the things I've done. But yeah, I think basically at heart I'm a pretty good person. Are you going to heaven? Yes, I basically think I'm going to heaven. You know what the law is meant to do? It's meant to shut mouths exactly like that. And it's not, I'm only using the fact of the prison because these guys have been caught. The fact is, the Scripture says we're all guilty, we're all criminal, we're all 
under sin. We're all bad. There's not one of us that does good. Listen, the guys in prison, the only reason they're there is they did a bad enough crime enough times that they got caught. What the Bible says is we're all criminals. And if you break the law at one point, it's amazing how we can look at guys like that that are in prison and somehow think, well, we're not as bad as they are. But Scripture comes at us and says, close your mouth. Close your mouth. You are guilty and you are on your way to hell and the wrath of God abides on you right now. Close your mouth. You're in trouble. And, and that's why chapter 2 is saying things like, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself. You know what? The most moral person... The, this is speaking to the Jews. Why? Because they would look at the heathen, at, at the... At, at these uh, Gentiles over here who were falling down before their idols. And you know, they're, they're acting pretty boastful, pretty proud, pretty self-righteous. Why? Well, because they weren't doing that. They had their temple, they had their tabernacle before that, they had their, they had their God-prescribed ways for worship, they had the oracles of God, they had the Word of God, they had the patriarchs, they had all this stuff. So they thought, isn't that how they marched in with Jesus? And, and to John the Baptist, John the Baptist says, don't say to yourselves that you've got some family connection here with Abraham. That doesn't cut it. Don't, don't claim Moses... Jesus said, because he speaks against you. He was for me. This one, this one here you're boasting in. And the writer of Romans is saying, you're without excuse. You see, it, it basically condemns all of us. And what God does, we looked at this last week, when our mouths are stopped and we're all held accountable... Verse 20 says, For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. By works of the law, you have no hope. Because what the law says is keep me and live. And if you break it once, that's it. You're a criminal. And you're a criminal in God's courtroom. And every crime in God's courtroom is a capital offense. Every one. It's death penalty. And you know what? You know what? We're told in scriptures, men are bold to go and sin more because the penalty isn't exacted immediately. You see what I'm saying? When man sins, his sin is primarily, ultimately, against God. It falls short of his glory. It exchanges his glory for something else, and that is man's great crime. He exchanges the glory of God. Rather than living to love God, and please God, and delight in God, and worship God, man says, I want my sin. And in choosing his sin, he turns from God. Do you understand that? When you choose sin, you reject God. And in God's courtroom, it's a capital offense. And because man is not struck dead on the spot the first time he sins, you know what he thinks? He thinks that in the end, there won't be any penalty. That's what he thinks. He thinks, I got away with it today. And so I can get away with it tomorrow. And in the end, in the end, God's going to somehow bend the rules, ignore my sin, sweep it under the carpet. Don't you believe it? Listen, it's not just every sin is a capital offense. Every sin you have committed demands the death penalty. Who can number their sins? You have so many sins 
and everyone demands the death penalty. And God is so pristinely just. His justice will never be bent. It'll never be flawed. It'll never be ignored. God will be just and He will punish every sin to its fullest measure. And when He gives the law, it is not for you to say, oh, let me see if I can keep it, and then I'll get to heaven. Listen, when I was a child, my conscience bothered me. Living in a kind of a Catholic background type of family, I come to my mom. I said, Mom, what do I have to do to get to heaven? She said, keep the law. Do the Ten Commandments. Her answer really wasn't much different than Jesus' answer to the young ruler, right? The difference was my mom meant for me to try to keep it where Jesus was trying to convince this young man that he couldn't keep it. You see, that law wasn't given for the reason my mom was giving it to me, which is, go try to keep it as best you can. That law was given. You know what I did? I went and I opened my Bible. I opened the family Bible. You know, one of these great big things that sits on the shelf and is never meant to be used by anybody. This is decoration. And I opened it up and I found the Ten Commandments. And rather, I looked at those Ten Commandments and I was immediately struck by the fact that I had not kept them all. But my second thought was, I need to try harder. As though what? As though if I tried harder and had any little bit of success, it would undo what I already had broken? You see, the law was never given for that reason. It was given so that I would look at it and see that I had broken it and then in desperation say, God help me. What do I do now? And that's where the Apostle Paul would have broken and said, I have good news for you. There is now a way to become righteous aside from the law. Oh yeah, Paul, what's that? Well, there's a righteousness that we're told doesn't come that way. See, verse 20 says, By works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. There's a way to get it without the law. And we know this righteousness of God comes by faith. That's what it says. Verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Everything God demands that you could never do, He provides by what Christ did to you if you believe in Him. And it's for you. A righteousness that no longer comes through the law. If you've got any idea whatsoever, any idea whatsoever of being good to earn God's favor, then you have no part in this. You have no part in this. This is for those... You know what faith is? We talk faith, but you need to realize what it is. Faith is when I look away from myself. You see what the law does? It says, no help here. Shut your mouth. Don't boast. You can't do it. Faith says, okay, if I can't do it, I've got to look somewhere else. Faith is that which looks outside of self and it says, Jesus, there's my answer. 
Christ has done what I could not do. He earned a righteousness that I could never earn, that Israel could never earn, that Adam could never earn. Adam fell. The Jews, they were no better off. He concludes all Jew and Gentile under the power of sin. There's none righteous. The Jew didn't figure out righteousness. The Gentile certainly didn't. They're all together worthless. Worthless. You know, what it, you know what's a dead giveaway? That somebody, no matter what they claim they are, that somebody really doesn't know about the grace of God? is when they start boasting about themselves. They can claim to be a Christian. They can claim to be religious. They can claim to be this and that. But you start talking to them and they want to tell you all about them, all about how good they are, all about what they've done. The person that boasts is a dead giveaway. They don't understand this. When you come across somebody and their boast is all about Christ, then you're on to something that, you know what, this person found. What's the, what's the Beatitudes? Blessed are the poor in spirit. What does poverty of spirit look like? It means, I'm broke! Bank account's empty! God says, you owe me! <coughs> and I look at the checkbook ledger and it says, Minus 10,000 talents. I can't pay. I not only don't have anything, I'm in debt so far. It would take me... A, you know, that's what the parable says, right? The one servant owed what he couldn't pay in a million lifetimes. I mean, it's something like that. 10,000 lifetimes or something. When you figure out how many talents he owed. A talent was a weight. <coughs> you know what? When I was a child, I used to have this recurring nightmare. It was a nightmare that I was, oftentimes it seemed like I was in space and there was a wall, like a steel wall that was infinitely thick. And I only had my hands and somehow I had to get through it. And it was so thick and I mean, I would wake up as a child in horrified. It was like I had to get through this wall that was so thick with my bare hands, I couldn't even begin to weather this thing. Or it's the same kind of nightmare of thinking about, you know, like you've heard maybe before, like a bird that would come in and pick up one grain of sand and have to fly it to the moon and back and forth until all the sand of the earth was taken grain by grain. It's just impossible. You see, the law wants us to look at this and say, utterly hopeless. You have no hope. You need to look outside yourself. And so faith is when I look away from me, I look to Christ and I see, oh, He's kept it. He kept every, every aspect of righteousness. He was living righteousness. He was perfection exemplified. He came... God, bodily, incarnated into this world, took upon Himself human flesh, and He kept, He came under the law. 
and he kept it. Now listen, what we're told here is this. There is this righteousness. It's for all who believe. And we went through this last week. But then here's the thing. If this is true, we've all done nothing but sin. I mean, that's what it says. It says at the end of verse 12, no one does good, not even one. There's no good. Because the best things you've ever done, God looks at them and finds them wanting. What does that mean? He looks at them and He doesn't find it perfect. You've never done anything that was done perfectly, ever. It's all flawed. You say, you see, you might accept something flawed, but God doesn't. God demands it perfect. If it's not, it's flawed. If it's flawed, to Him it's unacceptable. Because it's criminal. You need to remember that. It's not just that something about it doesn't look perfectly beautiful. It's flawed in that it's wicked. Your inability there is not just your inability. It's your crime. It's you at enmity with God. It's you hating God. But how do we know? I mean, when we look at something like that, how do we know? How do you know? How do I know if this has happened? Okay, there's Christ seated at the right hand of His Father. He's earned. He came and He went through life. And He did it without flaw. And now, when a sinner looks to Him and trusts Him, calls upon Him, looks to Him for help, when the sinner's mouth is shut, blessed are the poor in spirit. Got nothing here. And I realize it. I'm bankrupt. I need help and it needs to come from outside of me. And I see, oh yes, there is a way to be righteous before God without keeping the law. Because that's good because I haven't kept it. And neither of you. So that's good. That's... Listen, when the Gospel says it's Gospel, when it says it's good news, it means, folks, it's the best news you could ever possibly hear. And to people upon whom the wrath of God abides and who is headed, you and I, headed to an eternal hell, hopeless, without Christ, without God, without mercy, without even a drop of water for your parched tongue, when you're headed to a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, a place that's described as outer darkness, and a place that will punish you with exact justice. It will not be cruel. It will not be anything more than you deserve. But your sin deserves far more than you have ever imagined. And when you're headed for a place like that, the wrath of God is upon you. You're already on death row. You're just waiting the execution. You've never kept the law. And you come to hear you can be accepted by God without keeping the law. That's reason to jump right out of your shoes. Don't you think? But then here's the thing. We got people everywhere saying, well, I believe in Jesus. Let me tell you something. This book of Romans, there is an agenda here. And it is not only to show us the glories of justification by faith. In other words, trusting Christ and being declared righteous. Not because I kept the law, but because He did. His righteousness is imputed to me. But it's all legal. How can I know if it's happened if it's all legal? Well, Paul doesn't leave us in the dark. You see, Paul realizes something. He realizes this. He knows 
that because this is true, you can be really, really, really bad. You can be a serial killer. You can have murdered. You can be like Paul who approved of the putting to death of Christians. You can actually have lived a life where you persecuted God's people and even had them put to death. And Jesus said as much as, listen, as much as you've done it under one of the least of these little ones, you've done it unto me. But I can tell you this, when Peter got up on the day of Pentecost, he said, you crucified Him through the hands of these lawless men. You did it! And when they said, wow, we did. We killed the Son of God. What should we do? Peter didn't say, you know what? Your crime is so bad, it's so horrible, there's no hope for you. You see, this is the beauty of the grace of God. You can be in this room and your crimes can be stinking self-righteous Phariseeism all the way out to the other extreme where you're just a cold-blooded murderer and you killed the Son of God Himself and everything in between. You can be vile. Listen. Have you thought things when no one else saw that were so wicked, so dark, you have, and so have I. And you've done things when you thought no one was watching. You've done things, you've thought things. The truth is, if you could even right now be brought to remember everything you've done, if it could be put in a book, you know it would be hellish, you know it would be wicked, you know it would be bad. And what the grace of God does is it comes in and it says, no matter how bad you've been. You know what, you know what Jesus said to the Pharisees? He said the prostitutes, the tax collectors, they go into the kingdom of heaven first. How? I mean, we might expect little children to get in. We might expect the moral guy to get in. But prostitutes? But you see, if you think that way, you misunderstand. What are we saying? The children are good? The moral man's good? It says there's none righteous. They've all fallen short of the glory of God. They're all wicked through and through. I can tell you this, no man, woman, or child is ever saved until they come to this blessed place of poverty of spirit and looking at themselves and saying, that's true. If you reject that, you're not saved. And you cannot be saved and you will not be saved. That's what Jesus said to the self-righteous. He said, how can you escape Hell. How can you escape damnation? How? You can't. You who receive applause and commendation and seek the chief seats and you're boasting all the time and thinking you're good guys, you can't be saved. Why? Because you will not come unto me that you might have life. Why? Because if you don't see yourself as bad, you don't see that you need Christ. And you can talk about Christ, and you can talk about being saved, and you can talk about the Bible, but it's all a sham. Because Jesus came into this world to seek and save sinners. And you can talk about Him, but if all the time in your heart you really don't think you're all that bad, you're so bad that you can't be saved. That's what it is to be so bad you can't be saved to think yourself so good that you don't need Christ. But you can have murdered 10, 15, 20 Christians or even the Son of God Himself. And if you come to see yourself, I mean, this is where they were, right? Acts chapter 2, it cut them to the heart. The Spirit of God smote them with conviction. They said, what do we do? What do we do? They weren't saying, no, you're wrong. They weren't justifying themselves. They weren't saying, well, he was just a criminal. 
They were cut to the heart. They said, Peter, you've got us. We're, we're exactly like you're saying. You see, if you look at this, this is where I was. God showed me I wasn't good and I had never been good and I knew I was in trouble. I knew I needed Christ. But let me tell you something. You can be ever so bad and if you will come to Christ, you will find life. But Paul realized this, and he realized it from the very first verses of this book, that he was going to set down a gospel that was so wonderful, it was so good, it was so gracious, it was so free, that certainly many people were going to misunderstand. Let me tell you something. If you do not present the gospel in a way that likely will cause confusion, if you don't give further explanation, then it probably isn't accurate and it probably isn't right. You know what I mean by that? I mean that if you do not present the gospel so free, such a gift, so gracious, so saving to the worst of sinners that it doesn't have somebody saying, oh, well then why don't we just sin all the more? <coughs> you know, if you're saying no matter how bad you are, you can be saved. You see, if you're not saying it right, and you're not putting question in somebody's head out there that, well, what are you saying? Are you saying, you know, this is really it. This charge is being leveled today. I mean, even today, you have... The circles, they're going to come and say, you cannot present a gospel like that. If you do, people are just going to say, well, what's to keep me from sinning all the more? Why don't I? I mean, hey, but listen, this is what, this is exactly, look, look with me. Look at Romans chapter 5. Look at verse 20. Why was the law given? The law was given to show us our sin. And when the law was given, it made men more guilty. Why? Because they were already sinning. Now you to give them a law and tell them not to do it. They have greater light, and now they're going to go break it anyway. You see, now they're sinning with greater light. Their condemnation is greater. Their guilt is greater. But he says, the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. I mean, you know what? God gave the law, all it did was make men more guilty, but then He gave grace that it didn't matter how much more guilty they became, grace covered it all. No matter how guilty they were, no matter how rotten, no matter what light they sinned in front of, grace was always greater. Grace greater than all our sin. Isn't that what it says? Grace is greater than all your sin no matter how much sin you have. That's just the reality. And where sin abounds, grace just much more abound. You say, is there any hope for me? I've lived 80 years of my life or 70 years or 50 years of my life and all I've done, you don't even know the things I've done. No, and you don't know the things I've done. But I can tell you this, Jesus Christ paid it all. His righteousness is so perfect. His death was so satisfying to the Father's wrath. You haven't been too bad. The only thing that makes you too bad is if you reject that salvation. If you're so righteous, you don't need it that you reject it. And your blood be upon your own head. But listen, we've got to preach this thing so free that somebody's going to say, well, if that's true, that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Listen, one of the things that you have to realize here, you know what it says in Hebrews about neglecting so great a salvation? Let me ask you this. If God's salvation was only good enough to save pretty good people, would that be a great salvation? 
that'd be pretty pathetic in my book. If his salvation was only such that it could save somebody, yes, if they were a sinner, but only if they like sinned 10 or 15 years of their life, not too old. Or if they hadn't done, you know, you know what the Catholics say? Well, you can be forgiven if you commit these sins. But if you commit these, they're mortal. What does that mean? These are venial? These are mortal? Where, I mean, where does my Bible say that? I find murderers in heaven. Do you not? I find adulterers in heaven. I find those who killed the Son of God being saved on the day of Pentecost. This thing is so free that if, if we say it right, then somebody's going to say, okay, if I had, here I am, ready to, ready to call upon God to save me, but if I had one more sin, wouldn't He still save me? Yep. Because where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. If your sin's greater, if it's more wicked, if your sin's multiplied, where it multiplies, grace much more abounds. So if I had ten more sins, yep, you'd still get in. hundred more, yep. Well, what if they were compounded because I did it with light. What if I grew up in the church? Yep. And so somebody's going to say, well then what you're doing is you're teaching a salvation that has no motivation for righteousness. If I become a Christian, you're describing a salvation that I might as well just go on living it up in sin. And let, let me tell you something, brethren. If you're not presenting a gospel that gets people thinking that way, then your gospel probably isn't as radical as it should be. We need a gospel so radical and so free that we have to explain why it doesn't lead to unrighteousness. Because, biblically, when they laid out the gospel the way they did, it always led them to have to defend this. And so, if we're going to be faithful, then our gospel needs to be so free that it leads us to have to defend it. Now, now watch this. When Paul starts Romans, he says something that I have a feeling, if you've ever read Romans, most of you probably have just missed. Probably just went right over it didn't even occur to you. Look at Romans chapter 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle set apart for the gospel. He set apart for the gospel. Here he goes. He's going to give it to us. That's what this book is all about. This gospel that's the power of God unto salvation, he tells us down in verse 16. Now, this gospel, which God promised beforehand through His prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So he's going to tell us about this gospel that's been promised concerning His Son, who is descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness, by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship, now watch this, to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of His name among all the nations. Now I want you to get that. Grace and apostleship is given to Paul to go preach this gospel among the nations. To create a bunch of people who hear this gospel and all the good news and how free it is and then run around and commit all sorts of abominable sin. Is that what it is? 
It's for this, the obedience of faith. Well, you tell me, what does that mean? What do those four words mean? The obedience of faith. What does it sound like it means? Keeping the laws. Keeping the laws. And that's not, a, that's not a bad shot at that. I mean, listen. Let's just think reasonably. If Paul is going out to proclaim a gospel among all the nations for the sake and for the glory of Jesus Christ, and he talks about the obedience of faith, well, faith in who? Faith in Christ. Obedience to who? Obedience to Christ. Obedience to God. There's no difference there. But what, what's interesting about this obedience? Does this obedience flow from works of the law? No. It flows from faith. You say, wait, wait, wait a second. What does that mean? You're, you're saying, you're talking about obedience that's not by works of the law, but which is by faith. But isn't that keeping the law? Yes. But watch. You need to watch this very closely. Because if you miss this, this is life and death. Look down with me at verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God. What's this righteousness of God? It's a righteousness you don't have, I don't have, because we haven't kept the law. It's for that's what we saw over in, in Romans 3. It's for everyone who believes in Jesus Christ. His righteousness is imputed to me. Now watch this. In it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. In other words, a righteousness earned by Christ, not by me, is revealed in this gospel. It's revealed from faith for faith. Or as the footnote says, beginning and ending in faith. Or as some of the translations say, from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. You say, wait, wait, what's that? The righteous, those declared righteous by this righteousness of God who is for those who believe, they live life believing. In other words, what does this look like? There is a difference when a man says, like me as a little kid, who goes to the Ten Commandments and says, I better try harder. That's living by the works of the law. And the law said that if you do it, you will live. But I didn't do it. So I was under death sentence. But... If I see I haven't kept it and I look to Christ and I see He's kept it, then when I put my faith in Him and now out of love for Him, out of faith in Him, out of a desire to please Him, I am now in the power of His now given to me indwelling Spirit who is giving me good desires, writing the law in my heart, causing me to keep His statutes, putting His fear in me, giving me to delight in the things that are pure and good and upright and holy, writing His law there so that it's no longer grievous, now looking to Christ, 
constantly looking to Him as the one who earned my righteousness. So on my worst day, when I fall on my face, I can still say, you know what? I have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Even when I sin as a Christian, I don't have to be all discouraged and cast down, depressed and set back, ready to climb in a hole, throw in a towel, because on my worst day it still stands starkly written, there is now therefore no condemnation. If I'm in Christ, there is no condemnation. And see, when you live in the faith of that reality, that when I stumble, oh, but there is Christ, and He paid it all. And there I just stumbled, but my sin is under the blood. And when I do something, before when I was lost, though in my best efforts it was always defective, His blood is just washing all the defects away all the time. But let me tell you this, if your faith is not accompanied by the obedience of faith, then your faith is not the faith that's described here. The just shall live by faith. And, and see, this is really key. You look at, you look at chapter 3. Verse 7. Or how about verse 8? You see, Paul anticipates this. Some are going to say, and why not do evil that good may come? I mean, you think with me here. Is it true the worse the sinner is that Christ saves, the more glory in it for Him? Is that true? Well, it is. I mean, we're told it's so great a salvation. Doesn't the salvation appear all the greater the worse the person is? I mean, think with me. If you're a lifeguard and you work at the ocean and you have to wade out in three foot of water and rescue somebody, that's not nearly as impressive as if you see somebody out on the horizon and I have to swim out three miles and then grab this guy and he's pulling me under and I have to knock him out and now I have to swim back and through tidal currents and undertow and the storm that's out there and sharks and I pull him in. I mean, which one's more impressive? Obviously, the glory of the Savior is proportionate to the radicalness of the saving that He has to do. And so the greater the saving effort required, the more glory Christ gets. And so somebody can reason, well, why shouldn't I just be all that great a sinner? Hey, if grace is so wonderful and it's so free, let's all go out to the bar, guys. Let's drink it up and let's do this and do that. And let's, let's be. But here's what Paul says. He anticipates this. Somebody's going to say, why not do evil that good may come as some people slanderously charge us with saying. Brethren, I'll tell you this, if your message is not so clear and so free that it does not present itself to this slander, then I'm saying it's not radical enough. You need to have a gospel that exposes you to the same slander. But here's what Paul says, their condemnation is just. If you reason that way, your condemnation is just because faith that justifies is always faith that obeys. That's why at the end of chapter 3, we get it again. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? You see, that's what people think. If faith is so... I mean... All I have to do is believe? I don't have to do anything? That's right. That's right. Well, wait! You just said you do have to obey. Listen, what I'm saying is this. It's only when you see you're bankrupt and you look to Christ that you're justified in God's courtroom. But then, as a result, when you're justified... 
God goes to work on you where he produces obedience. Does that obedience merit God's favor? No, because it's only a result of what God's doing to you after he saved you. It's not you meriting anything. The only way to get to Him to get this grace so that you might obey is to see that you have never obeyed and to see that you need help alone in Christ. You see, we live by faith, which means we live even in this obedience, never depending on ourself. Always looking to Christ. Always to Christ. Always seeing no condemnation in Christ. Always seeing myself justified and accepted by God because of Christ. That's why in the Christian's worst day, he can get out of bed with a smile on his face singing hymns to his Savior. Why? Because on his worst day, he's still saved by grace, not by his obedience. And yet, if your faith is not coupled with that obedience, that's the surest proof that it isn't the faith that saves. Because where the faith saves, it's always an outflow. Not where you're living life thinking, I've got to do this to please God. But where you're living a life looking to Christ in faith. And as a result... You're wanting to please God. Not merit please Him. Please the God who has already accepted you. Who has already made you His son. Not, oh, if I mess up today, I'm in the doghouse. No, if I mess up today, He still has regarded me as the righteousness of God. Do you realize that? When the Christian falls flat on his face, the blood of Christ has totally cleansed it. And even if that Christian comes before his Father in that very next moment, he is still absolutely perfect, absolutely clean, absolutely the righteousness of God, absolutely no condemnation, absolutely no wrath, no fury. It's been taken away. You say, well, where's the motivation to obey then? Well, not out of fear of hell. There's motivation to obey because He's my Abba Father. There's motivation to obey because blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. There's now a hunger that He has put within me. The Spirit of God is working. I want to do what's right. It's not because I realize I'm going to get cast into hell if I don't. It's because... He has saved me, made me one of these vessels of mercy, chosen specifically for it, called out of the kingdom of darkness, a people for His own possession, who He desires to be zealous of good works, and not just a few. In this His Father is greatly glorified that we bear much fruit. And so we are now bearing fruit, not married to the law, married to Christ. He's our husband. And so, do we overthrow the law by our faith? No. We uphold it. You see, love fulfills the law. And that's the first and primary characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit. We're saved and Jesus begins to work His own love in us. He begins to work in us the capacity to love. And in that, we fulfill the law. We don't undo it. Jesus said, I will save them. You, you call Him Jesus because He's going to save His people from their sins. He comes in to not only give you a clean record, He comes in to save you. Listen, this is the argument. You, you literally see it everywhere here. Got these people, why not do evil the good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. Nope, it's not that. Do we then over... throw? 
the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Or how about this? He says to the Jews, verse 25 of chapter 2, Circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. Problem was, none of them were doing it. That's what he charges them with. There's none good. If you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. Now watch this. If a man who is uncircumcised, a Gentile, keeps the precepts of the law, you say, well, wait a second. You said none keeps the law. Oh, wait a second. None keeps the law as long as they're outside of Christ. That's why they desperately need Him. But if you come to Christ in faith, He will make you into a lover of God and a lover of men. And the whole law is fulfilled in this. You love your neighbor as yourself. He saves us to make us fulfillers of the law. And if a Gentile who doesn't have circumcision hasn't been given the oracles of God, if he comes along and he keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be re regarded as circumcision? Isn't this what Colossians says? We're circumcised, folks. The true Jew. The true Israel. Who's that? We're a true offspring of Abraham how? By what? Faith. That's what Galatians says. By faith we become a true Jew. A true offspring. Faith, remember, it's looking outside of yourself, looking to Christ. And if you're doing that, and now you're keeping the precepts of the law, your uncircumcision outwardly, so what? That doesn't matter. It's going to be regarded as circumcision. True circumcision. How do I know that? Well, because he's going to tell us that. Then he who f is physically uncircumcised but keeps or fulfills the law will condemn you who have the written code, that's the word of God, and circumcision, but break the law. Now watch this. This is key. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly nor is circumcision outward and physical. Obviously, there's a form of circumcision that's outward and physical, and there's a form of being a Jew that is outward and physical. But he's saying the true Jew and true circumcision? Verse 29, a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. What's that? Not by the letter of the law. It's not when you've got the law, you've got the Ten Commandments, and you say, I'm going to keep them. And you just gut it out in the flesh. Nope. When you look to Christ in faith, He gives you His Spirit. A circumcision takes place that's internal. That's a true Jew. It's by faith. The just shall live by faith. A true offspring of Abraham is made by faith in Christ. The law, Galatians tells us, is not of faith. You see, when, when somebody comes along and they, they're not looking to Christ, they're saying, I can do this. But you see, the just live by faith. What does that mean? That means every single day that the just man, the Christian man, the true Jew, rises up, he lives by faith. What does that mean? He looks outside of himself for any ability. The moralist, the Pharisee, the Jew in the flesh, he gets up and he says, I'm going to be good today. The Christian, the man that lives by faith, he gets up and he's immediately looking outside of self and he says, I don't have it within myself to do good, be good. But he looks to Christ. Lord, I need your help. And so at the end of his best day, you see at the end of his worst day, he can say, praise God. 
There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. And at the end of his best day, he can say, I can't boast in myself. Because if I have anything, if I outran others, what was it Paul said? Paul admitted that he ran faster than others. But he said, I do so by the grace of God. And he knew he couldn't boast. There's no boasting. 